So our next panel is something new at this conference uh, that a lot of you have told me that you're excited about. It's a panel of in-house counsel from the Bay Area who now all handle enforcement and investigations at, at their companies. In addition, all of them have prior experience in the ICC Enforcement Division. So um, first up, our moderator, Jessica Chan, uh, Senior Director, Government Investigations and Special Matters at Uber. Uh, she leads the legal team at Uber that responds to government investigations and inquiries on behalf of the company. And I want to give Jessica full and special credit here. This was her idea. She reached out to me. Uh, I thought it was great. And she, she lined up an incredible group of panelists. So thank you very much. Welcome. Um, out, of, out of the order I had it. But the next one next to her is Samantha Cho. Samantha is Senior Counsel for Government Investigations and Special Matters at Uber. Uh, welcome, Samantha. Uh, next to her is David Berman, uh, Director of Compliance and Ethics at Lyft. Uh, he has more than 15 years of compliance and investigations experience. <clears throat> he served on all three sides of the corporate compliance triangle, meaning government, outside counsel, and in-house. Welcome, David. Uh, to his left is Jason Habermeyer, who is Director of Compliance Regulatory Group at Schwab. Uh, he heads Schwab's uh, regulatory, regulatory compliance team for SEC, FINRA, and state regulatory inquiries and examinations. Welcome, Jason. And finally, um, pleased to welcome Dr. Hema Remrotten Lomax, Senior Corporate Counsel, <coughs> Integrity and Compliance at, at uh, I guess, was Snapchat, now Snap, right? Um, she formerly worked in the Global Ethics and Compliance Management Team at the Walt Disney Company. And Hema had one other very, very key position earlier in her career that really made me laugh when I saw she noticed it. Uh, she, she included it in her bio for this event. So when Hema was a law student at Georgetown, she was the first and basically the only intern at Securities Docket ever. And now she's here on a panel at this conference. <laughs> so thank you for all of that and for being here, Hema. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, let me turn over to you. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Um, and thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to organize this um, panel, the first uh, in-house panel for the forum. Uh, so before we get started, I just wanted to make two notes. Um, just a shout out to Justin Lichterman first, who uh, from Meta, who was supposed to be on this panel and unfortunately had to drop out in the last few days and was very integral to shaping the agenda for today. Um, and thank you for, to, to my colleague, Samantha Cho, for filling in for him last minute. And then secondly, um, some of the panelists wanted me to provide some uh, disclaimers, you know, that their views, that the views that they're expressing today are their own and do not represent their companies, so similar to the SEC disclaimer. So I wanted to provide that up front. Um, you know, I think what makes this panel special and what Bruce mentioned is that we are all former SEC enforcement attorneys who have now gone in-house. And so I wanted to start with a question about how your tenure as securities enforcement attorneys have translated into your roles in-house and how, how your work at the SEC has informed your work, whether there have been any transferable skills. So um, let me start with Jason um, to kick us off um, with a perspective from both sort of your role at currently at Schwab for a regulated entity and then prior to that at PwC. Sure, thanks Jessica and it's uh, great to be here. Uh, to be here together in person again is fantastic, and uh, my appreciation to Bruce for putting this together. A um, little bit nervous after that keynote that I don't say anything uh, <laughs> <laughs> completely off base here. Um, but uh, yeah, so in terms of um, transition from uh, the government to in-house, you know, I was joking with one of my Schwab colleagues recently that I thought that I had left behind the whole notion of having to navigate a, a bureaucracy when I left the government, but Schwab is growing so rapidly that it does feel like that sometimes. Um, so that's been an unex unexpected transferable skill. Um, but in terms of the, the transition, you know, I do think that going in-house is much different than working at the government or even at a law firm. Um, you know, I think that uh, you, when, I, when I started at Schwab, one of the, the things that was told to me was that building relationships was really the key to success. And that's not to say that you don't need to develop relationships at the government or even at a law firm, but it's a different skill set um, that I've learned. So one thing is, you know, you gotta be much more business-minded, you're much more involved in strategy, 
And really, like how you develop and utilize your EQ, I think is just as important, if not more important, than your IQ and, and those hard skills that you bring to the table. Um, but even though I've moved now from an, a, you know, an SEC enforcement background now to a compliance role, I do think that there have been uh, some transferable skills from my time at the SEC to now uh, working in-house. One is uh, definitely have to issue spot, or as we say in-house, uh, uh, identifying risk. And so that's definitely been, you know, I'm obviously not thinking about what charges to bring or who to bring charges against, but still got to be able to, to issue spot and identify risk. And the other is what I would say, just from my time as an investigative attorney at the commission, is uh, being able to use those investigative skills. So reviewing documents, interviewing witnesses, um, developing a factual record, and of course writing. Those are all universally applicable skills that I think apply to every lawyer, whether you're on the legal side or on the compliance side. Great. Um, and Hema, I know you've been in-house at two companies, first um, at Disney, a mature public company, and then now at Snap, that, and Snap recently went public. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, sure. So for, for first, just on that question um, of public, public companies that recently um, turned public companies, it doesn't really matter, obviously, how long companies have been around when it comes to the maturity of the compliance function. So one thing certainly that stands out to me is Disney's a much older company, so that's a much younger company, but they're both on, the, on their own journeys when it comes to maturity for compliance. But on the question of transferable skills, well, I don't know why those of you that have been at the SEC joined the SEC, but that we had some lofty ideals about public service and saving the world in our own little way. And I do think, you know, in order to do that at the SEC, I had to be a bit nosy and a bit curious. Um, curious specifically about what the conditions are for companies to, to do things wrong. What would, what would allow them to have misconduct? What would allow them to have fraud? And then also curiosity as to what conditions allow a healthy compliance culture to thrive. So although we didn't focus a lot on that when I was at the SEC, that was certainly something I was looking for constantly. Um, and I decided after a over a decade at the SEC in enforcement, to see if I couldn't go where the power was when it came to doing the right thing. Um, and that's really why I sought out big brands like Disney and Snap, because firstly, they, they pride themselves on their values. But secondly, almost their reputation is more important to them than their regulatory threats. They weren't really thinking about the SEC so much, they were thinking about their own brand. And as you know, social media these days, that's much quicker. That, that operates a lot quicker than our, our, our colleagues at the SEC. So in terms of transferable skills, I'm going to say being nosy, <laughs> for sure. Um, also specifically with those two companies, um, what I learned when I was at the SEC, I was very interested in FCPA cases and what happens when a company grows and it goes international. So I learned a lot about multi-jurisdictional cooperation, um, sweeps, third parties, all these interesting things I learned at the SEC and are critical to two companies that are growing globally. Uh, Disney um, uh, had the Fox acquisition just before I arrived, and so they were traditionally a very US-centric company, despite their parks in various places, but with the acquisition of Fox, Star India, Nat Geo, it's a very different profile, so I wanted to help them navigate that growth and how a compliance function can grow with it. And similarly with Snap, um, experiencing a massive growth curve right now, um, going very global, and so they brought me in to try to help with that. So. Very helpful, I think. I hope we'll see. <laughs> right. and David, I know you're in a sort of similar role at a newly public company at Lyft, which IPO just in 2019. Do you have any thoughts on this? Sure. Um, great to be here. Uh, I think I'd echo some of the points that Hema and Jason both made about being curious, uh, also having to navigate a complex uh, organization. So even though Lyft um, IPO'd in 2019, it's been around for about a decade, and so. One of the things that I've been doing over the past two years is just to get my head around uh, the company and the business and learning about all the processes that exist at the company. You know, I think when I was at the government and even at the firm, I thought about compliance programs as sort of a template. Um, and once you get in-house, and particularly when you begin benchmarking and talk to your peers, you really begin to learn that companies are quite differentiated, uh, that compliance programs grow organically, companies aren't born as public companies, right? Uh, the, the structures are put in place early on and then it's a matter of building and scaffold, scaffolding around them. So that's a big thing that I've been doing and that's um, uh, made use of some of my SEC skills. Um, I, on the other side of the coin, and maybe this isn't directly responsive, but I'd say a lot of what I do is actually quite different than what I did on the staff um, and also at the firm. Um, being in-house uh, to, to the partnership point, there is a level of consensus building and partner, partnership building that's required that was surprising to me and challenging and, and super interesting, uh, but different. 
and then all the work that we do in the compliance profession around building affirmative processes, uh, thinking about risks, uh, and then um, taking a step back and, and, and building structures around that affirmatively is new, and, and all the branding and marketing work that we do internally to build trust. Um, that all said, um, in terms of skills that have carried over, um, super helpful to be able to tell internal clients about your experiences while you were on the staff. Um, gain a lot of credibility that way. It helps, I think, distill the message, you know, to answer the question of what are we solving for, right? Um, everything that we do as compliance professionals, in some sense, slows the business down. Um, and so uh, really to be able to tell that story internally is quite helpful. Um, to be able to carry culture for the company, I think that's super important. And then I, I do continue to conduct investigations and that's a lifelong skill that I'm very happy to have gotten on the staff. Great, thanks. Sam, anything to add? Sure. Um, I think I'm the newest to the in-house world. This is my ninth month <laughs> of being at in-house at Uber. I also had a stint at the firm like, like uh, David did. Um, but I agree with most of what um, my colleagues have already said that you know, um, in terms of my principal work, the traditional investigative work um, and skills that I built at the SEC are, are directly transferable to my work. Um, I obviously don't have the same tools that I did at the government. I can't compel anyone to talk to me. But um, you know, what I do have is a relative ease of access to the resources within the company. So the relevant documents, the relevant um, employees that have knowledge of the facts. So I think it's, it may be quicker for me to sort of get a quick assessment of the facts, what, what the facts are um, and what the issues are. Um, but I, I would say that the objectives of my work are, are now broader and more forward-looking um, in that, I'm, as, as Jason mentioned, I'm constantly issue spotting for vulnerabilities, um, whether certain practices at the company might, um, may not technically violate the law, but may still invite regulatory inquiries or litigation, um, and whether you know, certain processes can be improved to avoid regulatory inquiries. So um, I fully agree with Jason and, and Dave and Hema's comments that relationships and EQ matter a lot. Um, unlike at the government, you know, the people that I interact with on a daily basis are my colleagues, they're my partners, um, and I want them to understand that the work that I do is, you know, is, is important, it is serious, um, but also to be comfortable to, to come to me when they think that something is wrong, um, uh, or more importantly, to check with me, um, or they want to make sure that they're getting things right. So I wanted to ask sort of a reverse question, um, if you will. Uh, I wanted to know, is there anything that you've learned while in-house that you wish you would have known when you were at the agency or wish you could impart to your former <coughs> colleagues? So let's start with you, Hema. Ah, oh, we knew it all at the SEC. Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, one th the thing I struggled with most at the SEC, some of it was covered in the last keynote, is how to understand how decisions are made and how information is shared. Um, how culture can be measured. These, these things are difficult to get when you're in that battle with the document re review and the testimony. And, I mean, I, I joked to someone, the best answer, the answer I got most in testimony was, I don't remember, I do not recall, I do not recall. Like, that, you couldn't do very much with that. Um, and so what I've realised in-house is decisions, well, firstly, it's complex. <laughs> um, you've really got to nail down the locus of decision-making. And it isn't always where you think it is. It's not sitting in those minutes. It's not sitting in those PowerPoints that go to boards. It's across various functions. It's very collaborative, so collaborative, <laughs> so collaborative that it takes a long time to get things done. Um, not unlike the SEC, I guess, right? You have to, you have to know that the decisions are rolled up. Um, it's a, I think it's a really good thing that the decisions are collaborative, but at the same time, you've got to find a way to get behind that. Um, in terms of measuring culture, um, that, that's something I didn't focus much on when I was at the SEC. Um, when I was investigating, you just dealt, you dealt with what you were trying to find. You were looking for red cars. You look for red cars. Like you saw them everywhere. But now what I look for is, what again, what are the conditions that would make a healthy culture thrive and what's missing? Because even if that's not what you're prosecuting, that's going to give you a lot of information um, for, to build your case. And so number one, how decisions are made. Number two, how information is shared. And number three, how culture can be measured. All right, Jason, you're next. 
Yeah, and I would echo everything that Hema just said. And let me kind of go one step deeper. I think one thing that I wish I would have known when I was at the commission is just how long things take, you know, to kind of pick up on the basically a common theme of what we've been talking about. You know, these are, you know, I've worked at PwC and now at Schwab. These are large, complex organizations that really take a long time to navigate who the right person is for a particular decision or, you know, who, who's the right person, who's the right business owner for a particular document. I mean, those, those things take time. And I think there, you know, at least speaking personally, when I was at the commission, there's a mentality that sometimes, you know, you could just ask the, the, person, the counsel on the other side for a document or for a meeting or for testimony, and those things would just magically appear. And, and, and it's true. I mean, when you have subpoena power, you can make those things uh, appear pretty quickly. But um, I think just the recognition now being on this side that things just take time to try to navigate. And the other thing that I would mention, and I think Sam's going to talk about this in a second, so I don't want to steal your thunder, Sam. But, um, you know, when I was at the commission, I think having that healthy degree of skepticism of the individuals and the entities that you're working with, but also realizing that at the end of the day, I think people are generally trying to get, they're, they're trying to do the right thing. And um, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that mistakes don't happen, but they don't happen always for nefarious reasons. All right, Sam, do you have, a, do you have anything to add to that? Thanks, for the, for, thanks yeah. for the teeing up. Thanks for the preview. Um, so, you know, at, at the SEC, obviously, my work focused on finding violations of law and sort of generally started with the working assumption that our investigations resulted from some kind of malfeasance, some kind of misconduct, and sometimes with bad intent. Um, by the people or entities that were the subject of our, of our work. Um, but I totally agree with Jason. In my experience at the firm and in-house, I, I find that the companies are genuinely tr trying to do the right thing uh, and spend enormous resources to do that. Um, companies like ours that have a strong compliance program hire many you know, former government employees and put them in diverse roles in the company, some in compliance, some in investigation, some in law enforcement response teams, and some in policy roles. And that is so true at Uber. Obviously, our uh, chief legal officer is Tony West, former associate attorney general. We have Scott Schools, Heather Childs, both, you know, occupied very senior roles within the department. Matt Olson, who was with us and now back at the DOJ, was our um, head of security. Um, and obviously our team, Jessica and I, and another member of our team are all former government lawyers. So um, you know, we understand that people who spent time in government um, understand the government's mission. Uh, they they agree with, agree with the, the purpose of the, the laws and guidance and work really um, every day to help the business to do the right thing. And doing the right thing at our company, at Uber, is not just a talking point. It, it is a central value that we, li we live by every day. And it's also not confined to only doing you know, what the law requires, but really trying to understand whether what our practices or process is the fair to thing to do from the consumer's perspective, the earner's perspective, and if we do come to a conclusion that it is not fair, fixing it so that it is fair. Um, and so in newer industries like ours, we constantly confront you know, new problems or new angles on, new, on old problems. My approach has been to help solve them collaboratively with my business partners um, instead of simply shutting it down. But I do feel empowered when it's time, you know, when it's appropriate to do so, when the analysis demands that the practice be stopped, I have, I have the, the power to say no. All right. Well, I'm, I'm glad um, that you and Jason raised sort of that companies are generally trying to do the right thing because I completely agree with that view and also just wanted to share kind of another point that's closely related. And, you know, you can, you can have a compliance program that is sort of best in class. You can have well-intentioned employees, but, I mean, as Jason mentioned, you know, mistakes do happen. Things do fall in the gaps. And, um, you know, as an enforcement attorney, as I'm, I'm thinking back, I think there's, um, it's easy to think that your principal objective is really to penalize bad conduct, but I think it's equally important not to forget that part of your role as an enforcement attorney at a regulator is really to help to shape business conduct. 
Um, and you know, when you're a government attorney, I think there's a tendency to sort of hold things very close to the vest. You know, you don't want to tip off a potential respondent about your investigation or your case theory. Um, but if a company doesn't know what you're looking into or what your concerns are, it's really hard for the company to really address those concerns. And um, and so I, I think you know, when you really look in, you'll see that companies are generally willing to change a business practice if it's appropriate. And if you just let them know and kind of engage in that meaningful dialogue, that's when that change happens. And so we do see, um, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, it's the government agencies and the regulators who are actually spending time to, you know, tell us their concerns up front, you know, and engage in a meaningful dialogue with us from the start that really obtain the best outcome and results. And so I don't know, David, if you agree with that or have any reactions to that or um, if you can add anything from a compliance perspective. Sure. Well, just to, I think, echo something that Sam said, and I think it was essentially said by others on the panel, I think, to be candid, when I was on the staff and maybe even at the firm, I was a little bit cynical about the way companies talk about their values. Um, I was quite surprised when I arrived at Lyft, which is a mission-driven company that articulates its values like many other companies. People take it really seriously, and it permeates business decisions, performance reviews, discussions about business strategy. So that was surprising to me. Um, to answer your question, Jessica, in a little bit a narrower way and, and away from the sort of high-level points about values, um, I was pretty surprised um, just about the way compliance and ethics, and by the way, that's, that's what I do. Um, so I think Hema and I have some similarity there. Um, we think about um, values and culture. We think about our hotline and reporting uh, and, and, and doing the right thing generally. Um, when I was on the staff, I thought about that in a narrow way in terms of like the issues that I was investigating and charging. So fraud, bribery and corruption, accounting and propriety. When I got in-house, I realized that compli compliance professionals, particularly who do compliance and ethics, have a much broader remit that isn't limited to the cases that, frankly, all of us in this room uh, think about a lot. So it's much more about culture. It's much more about psychological security. Um, it's much more about messaging, about doing the right thing in a broad way. Um, our hotline, you know, we, we benchmark our hotline, and so what I know from looking at the industry and from talking to peers, that the complaints coming into a corporate hotline day to day aren't all about bribery and corruption. They tend to be about HR issues, right? That, that's where you see the volume, and that's very much um, one of the things that we deal with internally in compliance and ethics is looking at all that material, not so much thinking about a potential law violation necessarily, but thinking about signals of culture thinking about looking for areas of the business that might need some more training, looking for leaders that, um, that are doing a good job or might be um, doing less of a good job. Um, those are all the things that we need to do as culture carriers. So that was surprising to me, but it was really exciting because uh, it allowed me to broaden my view. All right, well, three of you currently serve in a compliance role. Um, Jason, you're at a regulated entity. Hema and David, you're both at companies that have recently gone public. What do you see as the most important part of your job as a compliance professional? And Who are let's, you asking that? Let's, let's start with you, <laughs> since you spoke up. Uh, so I think a couple, and I'll refer back to what I was saying earlier, a couple things stand out. One, in, in terms of the relationships point, um, it's actually different for me now, because I've moved over from a legal role to a compliance role. So when I was uh, at PwC in a more of a legal, or, or in a legal role, um, I think you know people snap to it a little bit when you say this is Jason Habermeyer, you know, from legal, and no one really wants to talk to lawyers like ever. Um, but you know, people snap to it on the compliance side. It's a little bit different. They still respect you, obviously, but maybe there's not that much uh, snap to itiveness as you get on the on the legal side. Um, but they also recognize that you're trying to you know either find gaps or remedy gaps or you know, in my capacity, I'm dealing with regulators all the time. Um, so, you know, cultivating those relationships is a big piece of what I do, uh, as David was referring to earlier about that partnership and him as well, you know, building that partnership with your business partners and, and others within the firm. And then, again, going back to what I was saying about managing risk and, and identifying risk, you know, one of the senior most uh, uh, individuals that I work with, who of course shall remain na nameless, um, he refers to this as hunting it down and slaying it like a dragon slayer. And um, by that he means like when you're when you're pulling back the rug a little bit and you're seeing like some of those cockroaches like you don't just go oh man well let me put down the rug and that's going to be somebody else's problem and you have to really get in there hunt it down remedy any issues and then bring, you know bring in all the various partners to try to fix those issues so that's a little bit different I think from what where my role was on the legal side. 
All right, Hema, do you, do you have anything to add to that? I do. Well, I was going to say building relationships as well, but I think we've kind of said that a number of times. So let me maybe explain what I, I think that means for us, actually, in terms of practical steps. So we heard a lot from um, Director Grewal about trust in, this, in the system that is the legal system. And so the, it's very much the same when it comes to compliance function and business leaders. You need to trust. Um, there's a lot we're trying to do. You've heard, you know, bribery and accounting and compliance and harassment and hotlines, also culture. How do we, are us, these lean teams, do that? Well, I think you have to be a bit humble and recognise you can't do that yourself, and you have to empower and trust your business partners to do it, number one. Um, in terms of also building trust and building relationships, you can do a number of things. A lot of compliance functions will tell the business what to do and what not to do. Policies, obviously, are easy to do that. They may teach, they may do some training and tell you why <laughs> and how. Um, so you'll see that, you know, rules and processes in place. Um, what we like to do is just go a little bit further and involve the business in risk management. Um, what does that mean? Risk assessment is not for me in my office alone, my nice little red, green and yellow grid. Uh, risk assessment is for the business owners because we recognise them as the owners of business opportunity and then we therefore recognise them as the owners of risk. What does that mean? We need to teach them how to fish. We need to sh involve them in the risk management process. But... They're busy people, right? They're not lawyers. They don't care about this stuff as much as we do. So you have to kind of meet them where they are. And so I really spend some time trying to find out where are they? What are they doing? Where are they? And I learned, for example, there are formal... Who knows what OKR is? I didn't know this until I got to SNAP. Objectives and key results processes. There's goal-setting processes that the business are involved in as a matter of course. That's what they learn on their MBAs. And so what we try to do is involve them in risk management at source, teach them how to think what the vulnerabilities are, what, what activities are they planning to do or what are they doing? What, what are the vulnerabilities? I can help them with that. This type of activity makes you vulnerable to bribery solicitations. I can help them with that. And then they get to think about what they can do to mitigate those controls. Because again, I can come up with some great procedures. You'll yawn when I say, tell me every time you want to buy a cup of coffee for a government official. <laughs> but I can say that, but that's kind of onerous for the business. Um, we do that because, you know, we could, we're conservative, but at the same time, I can think, what else could we do to make sure that we're protected in that space and really have the business own the risk management and then think of us as facilitators of ethical decision-making? Um, we've talked a lot about companies wanting to do the right thing, but let's not forget companies are made up of humans, <laughs> right? So human-centered trust building is critical to our function. That allows those humans to feel they've got shared values, shared expectations, shared incentives, and if they have to make a difficult decision, they know to come to us. So that, that, that's my summary. All right, David, you were hired by Lyft to build out its compliance and ethics program. What have you seen as the challenges in building and promoting the program? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's so much challenges, and by the way, I'll plus one to, to what Hema said for sure. Um, I think a, a focus that we haven't talked about so far that takes up a lot of my time um, in addition to building relationships and doing all that work, is to build repeatable and measurable processes. Um, so young compliance programs are fundamentally reactive, right? And frankly, I think that's the way government works. I think that's the way law firms work. Um, but a, a compliance program, as I think everybody knows or should know, it's not enough to have the right policies. Um, you can certainly get to you know the right place by accident, but that's not the same as having um, a good process in place that uh, is measurable, that's auditable, that allows uh, me and my team to report internally on our progress. Um, so frankly, I don't think it's something that lawyers are really well trained on, um, and it's been a big steep learning curve for me, but a, a big focus of ours. Um, to Hema's point about sort of meeting the business where they are, um, that's also, you know, our, our business is accountable internally for, you know, whatever their business goals are, their OKRs. And so, we've had to really focus on that and think about how do we take the policy and implement it in a way where we can hold ourselves accountable, we can report internally, we can have the right dashboards and metrics. All right, great. So I just wanted to turn now to the enforcement side for a minute. And Sam, I think you're particularly um, in a great position to answer these questions, having first you know, left the SEC and gone to a firm and then now having come in-house. How do you, as in-house counsel, view enforcement efforts and trends? And is this view any different from how it's viewed by outside counsel? Yeah, I think at a high level, it's not very different. I mean, we look at what the leadership at the SEC or other regulators say about what their priorities are and what, how they're going to approach enforcement. And 
I think we try to keep on top of guidance from the SEC and other, other regulatory agencies in all forms, be it speeches, um, you know, formal policies or guidance like the FCPA resource guide or the justice manual. Um, but we also take cues from, you know, recent cases, proposed rules, and new initiatives that, uh, that are being pursued by the commission, like creation of a new enforcement task force, for example. Um, we take these cues and think about whether there are particular issues that we should be thinking about or reorder the priorities that are already um, sort of in, in motion. Um, where the in-house perspective differs, I think, is that we focus more on the impact to the business operations. Um, how does the regulatory guidance that we get from all these sources translate into changes in our practices, policies, procedures, um, or programs, or implement new ones, or, or not? Um, and sometimes it can be very straightforward. You know, for example, if a proposed rule would require enhanced disclosures in a particular area, such as the recent proposed rule on climate-related disclosures, we might scope out what that's going to look like, uh, what's, gonna, what's it going to take to make that enhanced disclosure in anticipation of the proposed rule being adopted, of course. Um, but sometimes operationalizing guidance can be tougher when the SEC leadership um, comments that they're going to pursue novel theories, it's going to be hard to build controls to ensure that no one will, runs afoul of, uh, of that because obviously they're, they're going to be novel. Um, and I think, you know, I think we all benefit from clarity um, what, uh, in terms of the rules of the road that we have to live by. Um, and the SEC has strong tools to do that, like the 21A report, um, which, you know, frankly, is, is a really good way to warn the public and the companies about what it's you know, planned enforcement trends might be. And, and frankly, I think it's not used often enough. Um, you know, I think it has, in terms of the, the, I guess it's a little bit dated, but the Netflix Reg FD report that was issued the way, um, a few years back, um, it has had incredible success in fostering compliance with that rule. And it, you know, great warning signal to set out clear rules of the road. Um, and uh, I think there's the D8 DAO report um, that set out rules about crypto, crypt, crypt tokens. Um, and, you know, companies and the public may dis disagree uh, with the views that are expressed in these 28, 21A reports, but it's, ha it's hard to argue that, you know, that the SEC has not given the public and companies fair notice about what its views are. Right. Um, and I agree with that. I mean, I think when it comes to counseling the business, you know, regulators don't make it easy for us when they engage in what we call um, regulation by enforcement. It's, it's when we get pushback from the business. Um, and in those cases where there's no precedent for an enforcement action, they'll always ask in-house counsel, how are we supposed to know that the regulator views this conduct as impermissible? It's, it's, hard, to, uh, it's hard for us to provide our clients um, with sort of ammunition to come to the table. So, you know, the best way, I think, for regulators to help achieve that compliance, and I agree with you, Sam, is setting out that clear guidance. And for the SEC, that is, you know, the use of more 21A reports um, to pro properly provide notice to companies about what it believes to be permissible or impermissible conduct. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about cooperation credit <laughs> um, and how companies can earn credit when the, the SEC comes knocking. So. Um, obviously, there was the recent SEC case, um, head, Headspin case, um, and I was wondering if you thought, Sam, uh, as you know, how you thought um, that provided guidance on that subject. Yeah, I think that that's. A, I mean, I appreciated Director Graywell's um, comments today about cooperation credit, and I think it does provide a little bit more clarity. But I think that is an area that you know, in-house counsel and defense bar are always looking for more guidance. Um, and it's great in, in terms of this case, the headspin case, um, that SEC says something specific about that. Um, and obviously, time will tell whether that's going to be a trend or new guidance um, going forward. Um, so uh, I assume everybody's uh, familiar with this case, but in case you're not, um, based on the SEC's allegations, the case involved a significant financial fraud or um, sort of headed and led by the company CEO involving fabricating and altering records and invoices. 
Um, and the SEC credited the company with restating financials, removing the CEO, replacing the senior management team, including the COO, GC, and, and controller, uh, and repaying the defrauded investors. And the SEC also noted uh, the other measures that were undertaken by the company um, that align with prior cases, prior uh, SEC prior cases, like hiring independent counsel to conduct an in inter independent internal investigation, and voluntary, voluntarily disclosing those findings to the SEC, including targeted analyses. And in that cir circumstance, it seems appropriate not to pile on um, and not to impose a penalty. Um, we've heard for years that meaningful cooperation can substantially accelerate an investigation, which is in everyone's interest. The SEC front office has publicly said that the seaboard factors and uh, that resonate are self-reporting and early disclosure, that a company should short circuit um, the SEC's investigation by conducting their own robust investigation. Gr Director Graywald said today, uh, pointing out hot docs, uh, presenting on what was discovered, addressing misconduct, um, and implementing a plan to prevent future conduct. Um, so in other words, merely just going through the motions of what is requi technically required by the subpoena um, or producing witnesses um, as called for by subpoenas is not gonna, not, is not enough to move the needle on cooperation. But I think the harder question on cooperation is what does it look like if there isn't this, you know, egregious, the, the word, I guess the buzzword for that, for today, <laughs> um, the flagrant fraud. Um, and how can companies who are sort of in the middle of an investigation but don't believe there's this blatant fraud um, get to the end more quickly? Um, how do they demonstrate cooperation and get appropriately credited for that cooperation without having to effectively sort of admit to violating the federal securities laws? And, and currently, I think cooperation assumes that there is a finding of significant fraud and that there will be charges. Um, and SEC leadership, as, as today, um, talks about cooperation through that lens, you know, by highlighting the benefits of cooperation, usually in the form of no penalties, sometimes reduced charges. Um, but the ability to accelerate an investigation and companies, you know, demonstrating um, cooperation shouldn't depend on having to accept charges if, you know, if the charges are not warranted in that case. So what I'd love to hear more from the SEC leadership is how it, it intends to instruct um, or direct staff to get to the sort of the crux of the matter more quickly in cases that don't involve outright egregious fraud. What does that look like? Um, just speaking from my experience back at the SEC, I, I try not to hide the ball, um, and I, um, you know, I was pretty open uh, about the potential violations that I was investigating um, in the hopes that I would get the relevance relevant facts more quickly. And, and I think at least in one case that led to a quick resolution of that case, which obviously benefits everyone. Um, but not all frontline staff will be as open, which could lead to a lot of energy wasted um, by companies trying to read between the lines, read the tea leaves, um, and time wasted and sort of chasing issues that they speculate that the staff are interested in, but in fact are not at all interested in. Um, and so. I was glad to hear that Director Grewa um, said that the, the Wells process is not going to be taken away. It will be made more, more efficient because back at Covington, I saw the first I saw firsthand the real benefits uh, of being able to talk directly to the front office in dissuading them from pursuing an enforcement action. So, if that you know opportunity gets diminished or taken away, I think that is a, a that is a loss of opportunity for companies to be heard and, and for the enforcement division to make well-considered enforcement decisions. All right, thanks. We're a little bit short on time, so I did want to point out, um, you know, I think you mentioned that, um, you know, how to cooperate in cases involving less severe misconduct remains sort of an outstanding question, but I guess even in the case of that sort of egregious or like flagrant fraud, or clear securities violation where a company is deciding whether to voluntarily disclose the misconduct and cooperate with the government, you know, obviously things have gotten a lot less clear. So as, as you all probably saw, in February, a district court in New Jersey held in U.S. versus Coburn, 
that Cognizant, an information technology company, had affected a broad subject matter waiver of its privilege by disclosing the results of its internal investigation to the DOJ. Um, in addition to finding waiver with respect to interview notes and summaries and the documents referenced during those interviews, the court additionally held that any documents or communications referenced or reviewed in preparing the presentation of the government would also be subject to waiver. Um, and then just last week, the, the judge in the case confirmed that ruling um, when Cognizant attempted to redact certain documents to protect the privilege. And you know, Sam, you and I attended the ABA White Collar Conference in March, which I'm sure many of you also attended. And this was a topic, topic of conversation on almost every panel discussion that we attended. And a number of commentators mentioned that this ruling could significantly impact a company's analysis of the benefits of cooperation and self-disclosure. I think it really puts companies in sort of a catch-22 um, situation. Yeah, I, I, I do think that it does put companies in a bind. Um, you know, it, it's, I, if you do cooperate to the full extent as expected by the government, you risk uh, yeah. waiving, waiving the privilege. So the, the decision to cooperate has become all the more precarious yeah. for companies. All right. Um, so we have a little time, and I wanted to turn our last segment um, uh, the last segment of this panel, um, I wanted to spend some time talking about two matters that sort of touch on both the compliance side and the enforcement side. The first is the SEC's recent enforcement action regarding electronic communications by J.P. Morgan, and this was touched on briefly on another panel. And then also, the um, if we have additional time, but we might not, the recent Rule 21F-17A action against um, that uh, senior executive of NS8. Let's just start with the J.P. Morgan case. Um, so here the SEC alleged that J.P. Morgan had failed to preserve business communications by employees using personal devices, WhatsApp, text messages, and personal email accounts. Jason, since the SEC's J.P. Morgan case was specifically based on compliance with books and records obligations by regulated entities, I wanted to start with your perspective. Uh, sure. I, I see Bruce here. So do we have two minutes? We have one minute. <laughs> okay. uh, well, I'll just say. Um, in one minute, I had like I had like ten minutes prepared, uh, but in one minute, I'll just say buckle up, and um, that, that's a, that, that's a, a throwaway that I gave I'm giving to David here because we were joking earlier in the week that nothing good ever comes when everybody uses that phrase now. Buckle up, like it, it's like it's like this ominous thing that like something bad's about to happen. I don't think it's bad, but I do think that there's definitely regulatory scrutiny in this area. I think companies, every single company in the country, should be um, thinking about this. They need to develop policies, and you need to think about. You know, Michelle talked about on the direct panel about, you know, bring your own device. There's that. I mean, there's privacy concerns. There's so much in this area that you really have to manage. And also, you have to think about, like, those government investigations down the line, how you're going to manage those on the, on the back end. So uh, plenty. Uh, we could have done a whole 45-minute panel of just this. Yes, thing. we could have. And, and on Hanson, I'll just say we're the third panel that was excited to talk about it. So really, <laughs> this is something where the bar is very focused. Yeah. And if you, I mean, if you have any questions for the panelists, please, like, grab one of us after this. We're happy to talk to you further. Thank you. Great job, Jessica. And thank you for putting together such a great panel. Really appreciate it. So our next panel will be in 10 minutes. Thank you.